All right, welcome back to Sculpture Parks and Public Art. Uh, this week, I actually have a little script for myself so that I stay on track a little bit better than I did last time. Um, so if you see me looking off to the side, I'm actually reading my little transcript. I couldn't um, figure out how to have it like teleprompter style. That would have been nice. So anyways, let us get started. Oh, my cat is eating a rubber band. So <laughs> let's get started. All right, so last time we looked at the connections between public art and architecture. This week, we're gonna discuss public art and censorship, um, including the role of commissions, public response, and controversy. controversy. We'll try to answer a few questions along the way, such as, what is the role of government funding? What are the artist's rights to his or her work? Should public art be judged by its popularity amongst the general public or amongst art critics? And finally, should public art be democratic? A famous recent example is Tree, an inflatable piece by American artist Paul McCarthy from 2014. Although officially described as a Christmas tree, it was widely criticized for its similarity in appearance to a huge green butt plug. Um, which is really in line with McCarthy's preference for gross base subjects. The controversy over the sculpture led to McCarthy being assaulted and the sculpture being vandalized only two days after its installation. A vandal climbed the fencing around it and cut the power supply which kept it inflated in addition to cutting the cords holding it up. But let's start with one of the classic art world controversies, Richard Serra's Tilted Arc. which was commissioned in 1979 by the General Services Administration. Like Maya Lin's Vietnam Veterans Memorial, this was a highly controversial, federally funded public art piece built in the early 1980s. According to Richard Serra, the viewer becomes aware of himself and of his movement through the plaza. As he moves, the sculpture changes. Contraction and expansion of the sculpture result from the viewer's movement. Step by step, the perception, not only of the sculpture, but of the entire environment changes. The steel is self-oxidizing, that's what core 10 steel is, and it's designed to develop a kind of natural rust-like appearance over time. But of course, the tilted arc immediately attracted intense negative feedback. Those who worked in the area found the sculpture extremely disruptive to their daily routines, and within months, the work had driven over 1,300 bureaucratic employees in the greater metro area to sign a petition for its removal. Sarah, of course, wrote, it is a site-specific work, and as such, it is not to be relocated. When the government invited me to propose a sculpture for the plaza, it sought to ask for a site-specific sculpture. As this phrase implies, a site-specific sculpture is one which is conceived and created in relation to the particular conditions of a specific site and only to those conditions. To remove tilted art, therefore, is to destroy it. The controversy brought Sarah to trial to fight for his sculpture in the most infamous art law case in history. 122 people testified in favor of keeping the piece, 58 in favor of removing it. Artists, art historians, and even a psychiatrist testified for the sculpture to remain in, the, in its location. Local workers argued for its removal. One person said, every time I pass this so-called sculpture, I can't even believe it. This goes beyond the realm of stupidity. This goes into even worse than insanity. I think an insane person would say, how crazy do you have to be to pay $175,000 for that rusted metal wall? You'd have to be insane, more than insane. A jury of five voted four to one to remove the sculpture, a decision that was appealed by Sarah, leading to several years of litigation in the courts. But the sculpture was eventually dismantled and placed in storage by federal workers on the night of March 15th, 1989. What is art and what is artistic expression is not the issue before us today. The issue is, 
What is the governmental responsibility in arriving at a decision to place art that is paid for with public funds in a public plaza or other public place? Before the imposition of this steel wall, the plaza served as a pleasant and humane open space for federal employees, citizens of New York, and visitors to this great city. The plaza and fountain were designed for and enjoyed by the people who live and work here. Contrary to the original intention and purpose, the wall now intimidates and prevents everyone from fully utilizing the plaza. In response to the GSA's request to build a permanent sculpture, I studied the federal plaza carefully and noted that half of the plaza was given to a non-working fountain. And it was my concern not to interfere with this space and the paths that lead to, from, and around the fountain. I also ensured that the remaining half of the space was left open for social functions of any kind. It is bogus and false to say that the social function of the plaza is destroyed. Also, the experience of art itself is a social function. It is curious to me that people who are concerned with function can't even put water in their fountain. Well, I should ask for and will be grateful for the cooperation of the General Services Administration to have the tilted art removed as soon as possible. Sarah would say that art is not democratic. It is not for the people. But what would you say? What would you say is the relationship to the site, to the public? Do you agree with Sarah that art is not democratic, that it's not for the people? This week, we read a chapter by Harriet Senny, who coincidentally teaches at my alma mater, the City University of New York. Um, so she focuses on a few key sculptures, um, comparing the very popular Picasso sculpture in downtown Chicago with Richard Serra's Tilted Arc in particular. She writes about how public art elicits such strong reactions from laughter to anger to pride. She focuses, however, on how often the reactions to abstract sculpture are antagonistic or violent because public sculpture has power and because it represents the powers that be. Cindy also wrote about George Sugarman's Baltimore Federal sculpture. Um, she discusses how this sculpture was seen as threatening because theoretically it could be utilized as a platform for speaking and hurling objects by dissident groups. <laughs> and its contours would provide an attractive hazard for youngsters naturally drawn to it or be used to hide bombs or other explosive objects. So in contrast, she reasons that even though Picasso's Chicago sculpture was abstract and people likened it to a baboon or a dog, it was popular because, well, primarily because of Picasso's established fame and because it came to represent the city itself. Quote, the public encouraged by the mayor and the media adopted the sculpture as a locus of civic pride. If Sarah's Tilted Ark and Sugarman's Baltimore Federal sculpture were seen to incite violence, Confederate monuments likewise represent and elicit violence for different reasons. Not because they're abstract and incomprehensible, but precisely because we know exactly what they represent. As Keegan Hanks, a research analyst working for the Sub Southern Poverty Law Center wrote, the hurt is still there. And we're talking about the public square, this tacit approval that's led monuments to sit there and people have to deal with them or walk into a building named after a white supremacist when they go to pay a parking ticket, for example. After the violence in Charlottesville a few years back, protesters across the country tore down, vandalized, or covered up some of these Confederate monuments, calling for their removal. The chaos in Charlottesville had been building for months. Since the city voted in April to remove the Robert E. Lee statue, there have been three protests, counter-protests, and now violence. It's extremely painful. I was in tears yesterday to see that. How would that hurt? It hurts. I want to mount it hurts. You will not replace us. Organizers of Saturday's plan rally had said it was meant to honor history and save the statue. It really is a sad day in our constitutional democracy where we are 
not able to have civil liberties like the First Amendment. But Wes Bellamy, Charlottesville's vice mayor, is among those leading the charge to remove it. They want to mask their real reasons and their true intentions for committing not only domestic terrorism, but trying to invoke fear in the community behind the statute. But this is clearly about white supremacy, and we're not going to have it here, period. Since 2015, when avowed white supremacist Dylan Roof massacred nine black parishioners in a historic Charleston church, parts of the South have rushed to remove Confederate symbols such as these flags in South Carolina and monuments in New Orleans. Three states have far more Confederate symbols in public spaces than any others, Georgia, North Carolina, and Virginia, with each more than 80. Tonight, in this picturesque college town, there is anger. Preserving history and recognizing history does not mean celebrating monsters of history. We've just learned that organizers of the planned vigil tonight on UVA's campus have canceled the event because of what they call a credible threat, though they would not elaborate. Still, for now, things are quiet, and authorities hope they stay that way. Kate. Gabe Gutierrez, thank you. Now let's take a look at a non-sculpture example. This is David Hammond's How You Like Me Now. Hammonds was commissioned by the Washington Project of the Arts to make a work for their exhibition on black culture and modernism. It was envisioned to be a huge 14 by 16 foot billboard that he created with a whitewashed photograph of Jesse Jackson with bleached blonde hair and blue eyes. Jackson had lost the Democratic Party's nomination for president to Michael Dukakis after hitting a wall of white voter resistance in Wisconsin. Um, so he was suggesting that if Jackson had been white, maybe he would have gotten the nomination. And the words that were written across the front of uh, Jackson's body and the title of the piece come from a cool Modi song. How you like me now? But when the curator, who is black, left three white staffers to finish installing the piece, and a crowd of young black men started voicing their protest against the artwork, they took sledgehammers to it and tore it down. Now the sledgehammers are displayed as a part of the piece um, when it's on display. So you can see those sledgehammers in the foreground there and the panels that make up the image. So to wrap up. What do you think? What is the role of government funding? What are the artist's rights to his or her work? Should public art be judged by its popularity amongst the general public or amongst art critics? And finally, and maybe most importantly, should public art be democratic? So for next week, we're quote unquote, taking it to the streets. Murals, street art, graffiti art, and guerrilla art is the topic. From the Critical Issues Reader, we'll be reading public art that inspires, public art that informs, and we'll be reading about the wall of respect um, we also have a short video posted by CBS Sunday Morning on graffiti, and you also have your discussion boards due by Sunday, April 12th at 11.59 p.m. All right, so until then, everybody have a great week. Take care. Let me know if you have any questions at all about anything that's due this week or coming up. Stay safe and healthy. All right, take care, everyone.